Um, hi, I'm Kerry Fukunaga, and uh, I'm here with Trayvon and Martin to discuss uh, Two Distant Strangers, their short film. Um, got asked by my old time buddy, Lawrence Bender, take a look at this short a couple weeks ago, and I got a chance last week to, to watch it, uh, a couple times actually, and um, was really impressed by the journey it took and sort of the surprise twists it had along the way. And uh, anyone watching either, if you have already seen the short, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it yet, then you definitely should. Um, and now we have an opportunity to talk with the filmmakers. So uh, I guess to begin with, <clears throat> film pandemic, filming during uh, what I would say was the, for many people, the discovery of what BLM even was, what, what inspired the short and can you describe how you made it in a time when it was very difficult to, to gather safely? Yeah, I mean, the, the inspiration was immediately drawn from, you know, what happened to George Floyd and, you know, the, the, the culmination of at that time, you know, the world was learning the stories of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey, and the three, uh, these three things had kind of converged on each other. And, you know, it had taken the country and it seemed like the world by storm in a way that we hadn't really seen before um, with, when, with these type of stories. And so, you know, I, as a, as a, as a black man and a filmmaker and a writer, you know, um, was going through that same cycle of emotions that I go through whenever I see one of these stories and you either see a video or you hear about the details. And, you know, it often, it oftentimes leaves you feeling like, it could be you at any given time because you don't have to do anything particular for it to happen. And it just reminded me of, of Groundhog's Day in the sense of the repetition of, uh, or what I call the, the nightmare version of Groundhog's Day because of the repetition of the, the horribleness that you feel going through that process. And so I immediately thought like, oh, I could write this. I definitely want to write this as some type of short form, uh, you know, piece that we could put into the world right now or as soon as possible while people were still you know engrossed in the story and the feelings of those happenings and so I when I got the idea I immediately told Martin um, we were working on another film together and uh, like he immediately took to it and we just you know knowing that it was July the time middle of the pandemic not knowing what was going to happen uh, going forward we just started figuring out how we can make it happen and pursuing any avenue and uh, financing we could to to make it happen. Not even knowing that we would get approval for it. We just tried to see what would happen and everything just kept falling into place. And uh, we eventually like got ourselves, you know, through a production in the summer of last year. Nice, where did you guys shoot? Uh, downtown LA. Was it was it doubling for New York? For some reason, in my New York centric mind, it was New York. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. You can talk about that. It was it was very important to Trayvon that it be New York. Um, and initially, when we, the pace we were moving, I was like, "Can't do it, dude. Can't do it." And then uh, he was like, "It really means a lot to me." And so we we figured it out. And so it was. It, I've been I because obviously a short film. Like I, I made a short film uh, that went to the. Uh, Academy like six seven years ago called Sketchy Boys and that film took you know eighteen months to develop fund get ready you know get ready this you know we were shooting like eight weeks after Trayvon pitched me the idea and uh, uh, but you know it, we've had a lot of feedback from people that really know New York that we that we that we did we did we, did, we pulled that off which was good good to know I don't know I don't know what it's like in L A but in New York especially in Manhattan if you're shooting you have to have a cop on set oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> we did have yeah, we had yeah. to, we had a load of downtime. We were like strangling, shooting, you know, we, we had yeah. to have like a shooting. Was, we had to have the whole thing. So, so like, how informed were the police about the, the, the nature of the story, <laughs> either before, during, or, or like, you know, during the shooting process? I don't know exactly how detailed we went into about what the nature of the movie was with them, but they did know that there would be gunfire and violent, and like a fight in. They knew what it was about. Like, I had one of them at one point. <laughs> I drove. Uh, I've got a, a, a an old vintage motorcycle um, that uh, that I sort of dust off every now and then. On the first day I set, I was like, I'm riding my motorcycle down, and uh, I forgot the tags the other day. 
And uh, so that I will, I, at the end of the day, I walked to try and drive off on it. And the cop guy was like, so you're going to make this movie and turn up with your tags out of date, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh dear. Um, there goes one of your groundhog days right there. Uh, what kind of motorcycle was it? Sorry, just real quick. It was an old uh, Honda CB. So yeah. it's, it's 1972. Uh, yeah. The other part of that too, Carrie, is, you know, choosing New York also was connected to making the plot work in the sense of, you know, in, in LA, you can smoke weed recreationally wherever you want. And so in New York, it's still a place where you can be harassed for it. Um, by a cop, they can be as they can be as nice to you about it as they want, basically. And uh, a lot of my friends' experience, depending on what color they are, is either they get bothered or they don't. <laughs> right. And and so it seemed like the natural place to do it as well to make that part of the story actually feel more real. Can we talk about the dog for a second. Yeah, <laughs> you know the, the the dog is almost like the MacGuffin. Like we never get to the dog. Um, what 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 role did the dog play, sort of, for you thematically in the story? It's it was one of those things that you know initially, when we were when I was seeing these stories, it was always like a person coming home from subway or a person just you know walking home or a person doing this thing, and I initially thought of the idea strictly from a. Joey leaves girl's house to go home just generally and encounter this police officer. And then I started thinking about, you know, how can I ground this even more emotionally for people who just don't understand these stories when we, when we see them on a, on a, a larger level. And I started thinking about, you know, well, everybody, especially, you know, white viewers of, of the film, understand the idea of trying to get home to something like a dog or a child or a partner mm -hmm. and people really really love their dogs even almost more than people I would I would imagine <laughs> like people just care about their animals and so I it felt like you know if we bookended this and made Joey's or Carter for that matter's mission to just get home to his dog it would like amp up the emotional part of it for people to really understand how innocent his journey is, which is like, there's some, there's an animal that needs him that's waiting for him at home. And this thing keeps happening to him uh, for no reason at all. And, and it would just help people connect to that, how, how deeply we struggle with just doing mundane things every day as, as black people. I think that definitely comes through, especially, you know, uh, without giving spoilers away, you know, in the credit sequence, just describing in that list of names what they were doing. And I, and I think especially given that, you know, I watched this after uh, the the Trump crowds stormed the Capitol building, right? Yeah. And you have all of these people that are saying, well, we should be, we should be, you know, pardoned. We are just doing X, Y, and Z, you know, and all this sort of privilege of like, none of those people, except for one lady, obviously, uh, having any kind of harm done to them for doing something as as egregious as storming our own nation yep. capital and then you look at people who are like you just said just going home to a dog and just being shot down on the street you know and or just sleeping in their own beds and it's just this is it's the kind of like comparisons and juxtapositions that that sort of people need to be reminded of because you i think the groundhog concept works so well because you know, you have so many people saying, or everyone thinking, you know, I'm so tired of hearing these stories over and over and over again. It is Groundhog Day. Um, do you want to uh, talk any more about the, the kind of how you chose the character or how you kind of created the character? Yeah, um, I mean, the Carter for me was born out of, you know, a lot of my own, just like my own life where, you know, I'm a six foot seven, former athlete, now TV writer, film writer, and I, I inhabit a world where most people don't look like me, where majority of the people I interact with or, or work with on a daily basis are tend to be white. And I'm often the only black person in the room um, or in, in any of those spaces. And so, you know, like I live in Beverly Hills now and 
my neighbors are all white. <laughs> and when we moved in, it just felt weird because, you know, they, the, the neighbors are nice and they all like come say hi and everything, or they watch you unpack like a truck and things of that nature. And you just feel like, oh God, we're the like, we're that family moving into their neighborhood kind of thing. And so for Carter, it was making him represent as many of us as possible. So he's, he looks like the way they stereotype uh, young black dudes. He has on a hoodie. He has like kind of froey hair. He does, he, he has a, a more of a, a, almost a Brooklyn vernacular and he's smoking a cigarette and he has a, a large wad of cash, but uh, he's dressed nice and he can be anything in your mind that you would want to judge him to be if you were a, a police officer. He could be, you could stereotype him as a drug dealer or some type of gang member, or you could just see him as a kind of artsy black dude. And so, you know, that's kind of where I tend to fall in throughout those lines where like, I'm from Compton. So people meet me and they'll go, oh, you don't seem like you're from Compton. And it's like, well, what, do, what are people from Compton like in your mind? And so <laughs> you go down that rabbit hole and um, that was the kind of the goal to make him, you know, not be what you think he is on the surface. And so like, he's a cartoonist, like he's an animator. Like mm -hmm. you don't expect him to, to be that. But I know a lot of nerdy, cool black dudes who also like draw for a living or who like, if you saw them, you would think, if I said rapper or, or cartoonist, you would believe both. <laughs> and yeah. so that was kind of the, the inspiration behind uh, behind that. And Martin also like just helped, you know, inform and feel in a lot of uh, some of those finer moments in terms of like really crystallizing him versus Murph versus uh, Perry to make the worlds kind of blend together in that way because the tonal changes when they all are together are so different. Yeah. Without giving away too many spoilers about where it goes in the end, what can you comment on in terms of like the larger plan of the universe of your short film? Um, <laughs> that's a good you know, question. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah. What yeah. is the what is the rules? What is the game? What is the yeah? You... It, I think it's um, it's finding it's what we are trying to do in real life, right? Which is try to find a way to break the cycle. It's, right. it's to get us to a place where you, if I had sat down, like if I sit down and write a movie about slavery, I know how it ends because slavery ended. So at the very least, I have an end point of, you know, in slavery, out of slavery. With this situation, there was no way to end it that was, that would be satisfying to, in any real way to, to anyone, especially, you know, Black people who experience this because there is no ending forward in real life. We are still experiencing this loop. And so it was like, how do we, how do we land this, this plane where we live in a world where it's not, it's still happening. So it became about hope and it became about, you know, resolution and resolve for Carter to, to figure out what the next step was. And so in that moment, he represents where I am now, where a lot of people I believe are now of, of all colors, um, which is trying to figure out how to stop this thing from happening, how to break this cycle. Tenacity. Exactly. Resolve, not, 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 it was, it was ne <clears throat> hopeful was never, was never an option. Um, and when we, when we settled on resolve, that was when we realized we had, we, we knew where we were aiming for. Yeah. yeah. Nice. What, um, were there any surprises in the production process, especially given, you know, shooting in quarantine or shooting in lockdown is so tricky. Um, were there any kind of surprises during production that kind of threw you or that you, you had to use your own resolve to get through? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the sort of probably the most incredible one um, that we wish we hadn't uh, ever, ever admitted as happening because so many people think uh, it, it we, we got a really amazing lucky one. Uh, there were so many points. This is, I don't want to say it's the easiest production I've ever been on, if it's a complete lie, but it, this is the production that by far and away has had the most moments where 
so many you know there's so many times in productions you're like oh that's the end of that we're, you know they were not it's not going to go forward and it, this this had the opposite of that would be I'd be like because Trayvon he's like do you think we can make this and get it ready and submit it to awards this year and I was like no <laughs> um, we'd, we'd require just a constant set of miracles and and we did and but the most incredible of all of them uh was the very final we shot the final uh interaction between the cop and the and the main character on the first day and we ran out of time ran out of daylight uh, so then we went back on the last day on the fifth day and did it as a sort of naughty pickup we weren't supposed to be there we had to sort of you know do it quietly and whatnot and the very very last shot <clears throat> was the overhead where the blood is pouring out of uh, of him on the, on the ground and we're just staring at it through the monitor and we're like that looks like africa like the blood <laughs> came out naturally just from the way like it, it wow. was like 70% of the way towards what we, we then we took we did some VFX work we, we inspired by that we were like mm, that's amazing <laughs> um, and but it was it was too it was sort of like um, you know we, we had another one as well uh, which is uh, there's a new thing downtown LA if you've ever shot there um, the, the you know, there's a lot of street guys and street women that sort of hang around and, and you know it's their it's their world and you have to work with them and and, and sort of accommodate it and um and uh, the newest trend is uh that they've all got these sort of portable bluetooth speakers like really really big ones and they sort of walk up and they just sort of start playing it um and you have to sort of deal with that because obviously we're shooting outside and we've got to we can't film while they're doing that and then at one point in a really sort of tense moment uh this guy kind of wanders up and he, and he sets it up he pushes play on his thing and he plays uh changes by tupac uh which is the uh the what well, the bruce hornsby track that's in our film is what it samples and where the title of our film is a tupac lyric from uh from from that song and then and he wasn't even there to cause trouble he pushed play started going and just went straight past us he was off to off to do his business and we're like it was like a drive-by uh it was incredible uh yeah. and it was a very good scene where joey's Pac. character is listening to that song yeah, yeah. Wild. And then you saw a rose gr growing on the concrete somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was magic, man. Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, <clears throat> well, I really hope uh, people, you know, show up to watch the film. Um, as you mentioned right there, you know, it's 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 a candidate for awards. It's a competition, and and can definitely uh, um, be uh, an Academy Award nominee. So, would love to see it up there. Um, is there anything else you guys want to f follow up with, uh, you know, like the last words about what, what the experience was like or what you hope people take away from it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, this was like Mars, like Martin said, it was, it was a, a, a series of miracles that, that made this movie possible in this time frame to write in five days, shoot in five days and be, you know, where we are right now. And it was an extreme independent film effort to, to do this and funding by the seat of our pants. We were still raising money. We weren't even fully funded while we were filming. We were still trying to get the money to finish filming while we were filming because we just couldn't wait. And, money, we can be honest. Yeah. And, and <laughs> we're looking for money. Okay. <laughs> and so so uh, it, I, I, my hope is that, you know, through our efforts as filmmakers and also as people that it inspires people on the creative side as well as it inspires people on the social justice side to to just you know experience uh the film through the lens of what it feels like to be black for 29 minutes and to to come out of it a little more understanding and compassionate for our experiences when you know we often find ourselves having to try to justify why we should be alive and it's very exhausting and it's very mentally taxing to, to live in that space day after day. And so if it eases that for, for us, even just a little bit, I think we accomplished our, our goal. Yeah. That's the great power of cinema. What, what about you, Martin? Um, I, this is an interesting journey for me. I felt like my, my role on this, uh, you know, Trayvon pitched me this idea, which was so, personal um but he'd found this this way of approaching the Grand Old day sort of trope and turning it into an allegory that was so powerful um and my job was to balance you train more joke that my part of my job was to make sure that we the white women kept watching um and 
but I think I think the, the deeper meaning there is I was trying to. How do you keep the white women watching? You, you already brought up the dog, you know. Like, <laughs> how does it? How did it not? Like a lot of the conversations earlier, and especially with Jesse, how does it not devolve into rage? How does it not? How do you? How do you balance? How do you communicate absolute fury in a way that keeps people who are part of the reason that fury exists engaged? Right? How do you communicate? Um, and that was what I thought was so beautiful about the, the the central allegory is that everyone, as you pointed out, Kerry, like you, you, are you if you're tired of of hearing about it, imagine how people tired are of, of living it. And uh, you know, so this was a very very interesting project for me as it personally. It was it was what it was a uh, when we were sort of balancing the professional role of like use use used to ordering people, used to like monofocusing on what needs to be achieved. But this one, I'm like, this is Trayvon's heart and soul. And so how do I, how do like, how do I bring, uh, how do I bring my responsibility to that whilst never tampering with that? And, and it was, a, it was an incredible journey for me in that regard. And I, and I loved it. But um, I think in terms of big summations and big points about what the movie's about, it's, it's, this is Trayvon's, you yeah. know. I have a question, uh, Trayvon, actually, in, in the aftermath of the creating the film, have you heard, has it created or sparked people to tell you, people to tell you their stories more? You know? Yeah. I've, you know, I've, sort of like what they feel like is their own version of Groundhog Day. Yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten a handful of people, you know, as we slowly, uh, because we don't have distribution, the movie hasn't been seen widely, but you know, in the screenings that we've done, we did a public screening on Martin Luther King Day for the NAACP in Cleveland and you know we have we have one coming up uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus, and it's one of those things that it when people see it, they immediately at least if they have experience with these type of stories, there's been a handful of people who DM me on Instagram or or, or message me on Twitter about you know how much they struggle with carrying around that same feeling every day, and how you know I understand that it's tougher to watch for us as black people because we carry it around in a way that other people don't. Mm -hmm. And so, but they they get through it. And, and I've heard had people go, you know, in the first few minutes, I almost couldn't couldn't stay until I realized, you know, what was happening and and you know what you were trying to say. And um, you know, I I wanted this to be shared with as many people as possible who have direct experience with, you know, police violence and things of that nature, and not to to induce trauma, but to to give them something that they can share with other people who don't understand how they feel. And so for it to be a piece of, of, of art and a, and a film that they can say, hey, this explains it emotionally better than I can tell you with words yeah. of what it's like to go through what I've gone through. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if, you know, in a short period of years from now, people can look at this film and saying like, that's so absurd, that could never happen because the, the world has changed. But the, but, the, but the tragedy is right now, as absurd as the concept of this groundhog repetition is, it is actually happening on repetition every day. Absolutely. I would love to get to a place where this film is like watching Lincoln or something where you're like, that was crazy. Yeah, man, I hope so too. I really do, so. But I think I think films like this are important, sort of not only in terms of like creating change, but you have to like document in in new ways, you know, through through these sort of metaphors, you know, reality. That's the way it's it it, it it you know creates meaning, that context. So thank you for making this film. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for time. Thanks a lot. And for anyone else watching, I really hope you guys uh, make the time to watch the film. And uh, if you have opportunity to uh, get it out to more people, please do share and distribute. Legally, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right.